Jeffrey doesn't care about the consequences of his actions. Jeffrey will do whatever he wants to get that instant hit of dopamine. But can you blame Jeffrey? Jeffrey's been raised in a way to value hedonism, in a way to value his own pleasure over others. But then we have Adonis. Adonis is vegan? Well, maybe he might be. He's a man of moral principle. He cares about his tribe and he wants his descendants to live in a world that hasn't been destroyed by our actions. He cares about his fellow creatures and knows that they can suffer just like we can. But wait, doesn't Adonis hunt the boar? Doesn't he go and kill boars and kill animals to provide? So, which is it? We know that we come to self-improvement videos to be called out on our behaviours. And this is one of them. And you're allowed to disagree with me. Like I said in the first episode of the series, we need to think critically, both about our own beliefs and the information that we hear. So think critically about this video and come to a conclusion about what you feel is the best course of action here. Welcome back to the Actualization Project. This is a series where we talk about how to improve ourselves exponentially and we do this by talking about certain ideas and by implementing those ideas into action we can see our lives transform drastically. One of these pillars is moral self-improvement that is improving our moral character and our behaviours and the reason for this is that it makes us a better person but it also means that we're able to transform the way we interact with others. And I'm going to be making the case that veganism is one way to do this. This is quite an important aspect of moral self-improvement. The case I'm going to be making here is that because animals are able to suffer, we should give them the rights to not be killed or exploited unnecessarily. And this is being done for such a trivial reason. It's being done because of culture that has propagated but it's being done because of trivial taste pleasure and because of habit. It's a bad habit like any other, really. So at least you should hopefully be able to see at least why I'm making this kind of case. You can maybe see where I'm coming from. But if we think about what actually consuming animal products is, it's short-term pleasure. We know that instant gratification isn't worth it, and in many ways this is similar to instant gratification. Not in the way that will necessarily make your life worse, though there may be some health reasons why it might, but it's something pleasurable in the short term that's going to damage the lives of others, both your descendants in the future if you have any, or people in the future in terms of the environment, and of course many many animals, right? And we know that animals are able to suffer, they have the same basic biology that we do in the fact that they have a central nervous system, many of them have brains, many of them have pain receptors. We know they're able to suffer, we know that animal cruelty is a real thing. And even if you have the belief that animals are fine to eat by nature, that they were put on this earth for us to eat, the case I'm making is that in the current system that we have, it's simply not moral in any foundation, religious, not religious, any moral foundation, even in an egoistic one, even when you only care about yourself. There's still many reasons why veganism is still the moral course of action that we should take. I'm just going to give you a few examples of what happens in the animal agriculture industry. And this is where the majority of animal products come from, because this is how it's been industrialized to feed such a large population at scale and to provide the amounts of animal products that are available. So I'm just going to give you three examples. We're going to be talking about the egg industry, the dairy industry, and the broiler chicken industry, how chicken is procured, right? How, how chickens are raised for meat as well. And this applies to all of the animals in terms of the similar kinds of practices that apply. You can look into this, you can research into this. This isn't some propaganda. This is what happens. So. We can actually start with the broiler chickens, right? So, they've been selectively bred. The, the species of chickens, I believe, that are called broilers. And they've been, well, like, commonly called broilers. And they've been 
selectively bred so that they grow massive. I don't know if you've seen pictures, but like these chickens, they grow to be massive, right? They're huge. And that's only in a few weeks. So in their like biological life, they're only like chicks. They're only right at the start. And they're only a few weeks old when they get slaughtered. They're killed so early because their meat is already significant enough for them to be killed at that stage. And they've been selectively bred so that at that point, they're ready to be slaughtered. So this is much more premature than their natural lifespan already. So we're denying them that existence by slaughtering them at only a few weeks old. And it doesn't matter how they're raised really that much. Even if you call it free range or organic, their lives are only slightly longer. They only have slightly more space. They're only allowed to go outside for a small amount of time. It's not much. And they're raised in these cramped conditions, regardless of any of those forms of farming. They're in cramped conditions. They're fed loads of antibiotics because of those conditions. A lot of them are de-beaked. Their beaks are taken off because they get aggressive and irritated in those environments because it's so harmful to them. After they've lived this short, painful life of growing up so quickly that their own bodies haven't been able to support them, of being in these cramped conditions, and they would be riddled with disease if it weren't for the antibiotics that we put into them. And that's contributing to a massive amount of antibiotic resistance. About 70% of all of the antibiotics we use are used on, on animals in animal agriculture. And that's contributing to the massive problem of antibiotic resistance, which means that soon many of our diseases won't be curable anymore. We won't be able to cure a lot of these diseases because our antibiotics won't be working anymore. And by keeping animals in this cramped condition, we're just accelerating that problem even more. And obviously there's a massive risk of pandemics as well. If you've heard of bird flu, by keeping animals in this close condition, we're breeding diseases and a lot of these diseases can end up being zoonotic, meaning that they can be transferred from the animals to humans as well. So there's just a risk of public health as well involved. I'm not even giving you full details here, I'm just giving you a very brief picture of what happens. And this is just a tiny aspect of this system of animal agriculture that has been put into place. Because it values efficiency and it values product so much, it disregards the lives of these animals. It just sees them as objects for human gain. And we wouldn't think this of other animals we know that can suffer. Cats and dogs, we know these can suffer. And some cultures do consume these animals, but for many of us, we see it as a moral crime to have killed a cat. Imagine raising cats or dogs in these environments where they're killed prematurely, where they've been selectively bred into this mutated form that they never would have been. And they suffer in that because they grow so fast, these broiler chickens, for example. They grow so fast that their bodies aren't naturally able to support them. They suffer a lot of injuries. They suffer a short life of suffering. And then they're killed for, what, some chicken wings? Some short pleasure? Isn't that just instant gratification? Is harming these animals every time you consume things? Let's talk about the dairy industry. So how do you think that milk is obtained? Well, a cow has to be pregnant, just like any other mammal has to be pregnant to produce milk, right? So they're forcibly impregnated and they're made to give birth to a calf. And then that calf is taken away because we can't be having the calf taking away our products, can we? So those calves are taken away and as these are animals that are able to suffer and as these are mothers who have emotional attachments to their children, they're in great suffering and it's very traumatizing for them to have that calf taken away from them. Male calves are often useless unless they're kept for breeding purposes. So a lot of those are killed and then the rest are kept for breeding purposes. And then the female calves are raised to be cows themselves to be milked. So we have this continuous cycle of 
cows being impregnated, having their calves taken away, and then having their product taken away. Well, we call it product, but it's their milk that was designed for their calves. We take their calves away from them. Now we take that product for ourselves. It's a weird, weird reality. And this cycle keeps repeating itself until eventually the dairy cow is spent. The dairy cow is not able to produce as much milk anymore because they've been through the cycle so many times that their bodies are exhausted, right? And at this point, a lot of them are killed as well. They're killed for beef. So even if you think vegetarianism is going to be avoidant of the moral issues that are associated with animal agriculture, you're not right, man. You're not right, because these animals go through a huge amount of suffering in this process as well. And again, it's premature. It's much shorter than the cow's lifespan would be naturally. And they end up being killed after this cycle, this horrible cycle of them being forced into pregnancy having their child stripped away from them, having their bodies exploited, and then being killed when they're not able to produce any more product. It's just, it's just messed up, right? And then we have the egg industry. So male chicks and female chicks are born from fertilized eggs. The male chicks aren't able to produce eggs themselves when they grow up. So they're useless to the industry. So as soon as male chicks are born, they're separated out and they're culled. They're thrown into blenders, they're thrown into gas chambers, and they're just killed off because it's not worth keeping them around. And then the female ones grow up and they're kept in these cramped conditions again. They're exploited. They lay about one egg a day. And that's much more than they would naturally. If you think about the human cycle of eggs, there's only about one a month. And that's quite similar to how it would have been for these animals. But now it's one every single day that's putting a lot of strain on their bodies, right? And then they themselves too, once they're spent, they're killed as well. So these industries of the egg and dairy industry, they're not exempt from the moral cruelty. I'd say, especially the dairy industry, is all the cruelest things that human beings have imagined. And this isn't to be an appeal to emotion. This is just describing the reality. And if you feel that this is extreme, if you feel that this is trying to appeal to your emotions, maybe that's representative of the extremity of what this reality is, of how emotionally painful it is to come to terms with what these things are. So for this following section of the video, I'm going to be directing you to a presentation I made, which is more on the environmental claims. So that will be starting now. Alright, so for this section of the video, I'm going to be using a presentation that I made a while back just to give you some visuals and just to give you some of the sources to back up the claims that I'll be making here. So, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, a large part of that does come from agriculture. As the um, pie chart shows you, it's about 24%. And as we'll see, the majority of that does come from animal agriculture. So by changing the way we eat and by changing our food systems, we'll be able to decrease the amount of emissions from that sector by a lot. And that will be very beneficial. And it's very important as well because there was this thing called the Paris Agreement. And their aim was to minimise the amount of global warming, to keep it below two degrees increase compared to pre-industrial times. So this study found that to be able to do that, it's only possible if our food systems are changed. So it'll be very important to pursue a plant-based diet to be able to make that a reality. And then we also have the problem of overgrazing. So by keeping animals around and by having this animal agriculture system, it means that we have a lot of overgrazing going on. And by doing that, that results in desertification. It results in places becoming deserts. And that's going to affect a lot of people, as these studies show. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then here we have, in the United Kingdom, which is the country I'm from and a country where many of you are from, right? It's used in a lot of ways for animal agriculture. A very large percentage of the land is used for animal agriculture. 
But then we see it's not actually that efficient because it only yields about less than half of the protein and only about a third of the full calories. The, re the rest are from plant-based products and synthetic things and other things, right? But what that goes to show is that it's not very efficient at all and it's using up a lot of our land in a very negative and damaging way. So we have here the effects of animal agriculture on the Amazon. So 80% of the rainforest lost, loss in the Amazon, right? 80% of that is because of animal agriculture. That, that's, just, that's just crazy to think about that scale, right? And animal agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation. It's getting rid of our trees. And as this study showed, it's about three quarters of all of the deforestation that happens that's driven by agriculture. Beef production causes a lot of it. Now, here's a point about palm oil and soybeans, right? So, yes, it's true that vegan products will cause some deforestation as well, but it's to a much smaller amount. And the thing we have to consider is that the majority of soy that's produced that's actually used as meal it's used as food for the animals that we raise so we decrease the amount of soy that we're using by a significant amount just by reducing animal agriculture and by eliminating that right so that's something that's very important as well so in terms of habitat loss as well that's caused a lot by animal agriculture too by doing that, you have a loss of biodiversity. You have a loss of habitats because of deforestation and other things. So other animals are losing their habitats. And then we're putting other animals there to be raised for food and killed unethically, prematurely, be exploited, right? So that, that's just not it either. And then it's a massive threat to biodiversity and species richness. Why is this important? Well, the thing is that in having that diversity of species, it means that it's much more likely that life will be able to live on. And it's much, it's beautiful in a way to be able to see the variety of life that is present. And there's a natural order of things that has been disrupted massively. So now we have a massive amount of biomass that is just livestock and that's just not really good for the systems that are in place at all and then we have overfishing as well so by fishing in the seas and by fishing in the oceans it's done to such a massive degree that it causes huge amounts of devastation and the thing is that diets that are not vegan right they're causing massive amounts of ghg emissions greenhouse gas emissions and the lowest emissions possible in those in terms of a diet is with vegan diets and that's very important in terms of our moral decisions too so if we look at this we see that the united states has a population of about 330 million as of 2019 right and here we have this scenario where reducing the animal agriculture and getting rid of that, you'd be able to feed 350 million more people by using that amount of the land that's in the US, right? So you'd be able to have so much more efficiency because to be able to raise animals, you have to feed them such a large amount of plants. You have to use so much land. And while some of that land could not have been used to grow crops, much of it could, and it'd be much more efficient in terms of our use of land to go off of plant proteins and to go off of plant-based foods rather than having this inefficient system of animal agriculture. And then here we have as well the massive amount of agricultural land use that's from animal products. So when we look at the uh, when we look at plant-based products, it's it's really small. Like at most, it's the tomatoes I think at like four square meters, but then we have 
for a thousand calories, we have 120 square meters for beef, and then we have a lot of square meters for other forms of animal agriculture too. And then here we have the difference of land use that we'd have if we cut out animal products. So we can see that by getting rid of animal agriculture, the amount of land we use is, is de decreased by 75%. That's massive. That's a massive decrease. And what that means is there's much more land that's available to be used in more productive ways and ways that can help with even stuff like homelessness to be able to build homes in these areas and just be much more efficient for our kind of use of land. And then here we just have um, a description of arable land. So some people think that uh, if we decrease the um, if we decrease animal agriculture or end up eliminating it, that what land will be left over won't be arable. So we will be we won't be able to grow crops there. So it's not really worth anything. But what this shows is that the amount of land that's available is still sufficient to be able to grow crops. And there's enough arable land to be able to do that. So we don't need any grass grazing animal agriculture to be able to offset that. And then here we have another thing about how greenhouse gas emissions and nutrification can be decreased massively by stepping away from animal agriculture and how animal agriculture uses such a massive amount of the farmland we have. It uses about 83%. And it contributes a massive amount of the emissions, but it only produces a very small amount of the protein and an even smaller amount of our calories. So it's just really not that efficient at all. And here we have a very detailed demonstration of the different foods that are present, how many greenhouse gas emissions they have, their land use, how much acidity they cause, the eutrophication, so the algae blooms on top of water, that's what eutrophication is. And then we have all of this comparison and what it shows again is that consistently animal products seem to be the most damaging when it comes to these criteria. And then here again we have um, the idea that by reducing our animal intake, by reducing our meat's consumption, we'll be able to reduce the emissions by a huge amount, 60-70% and being able to do that is going to be very helpful as well. And then here again, we find that deforestation for agriculture is mainly caused by trying to get feed for animals. So again, most of that soy is actually being used to feed the animals. So that's a big cause of the deforestation as well. And then here again, we have some more data. And what this shows is that we'll be able to decrease land use massively will be able to decrease acidification by a large amount. Um, there'll be a lot more fresh water that's available for use as well. So it just shows that reducing the environmental impact of food in a negative way, that's going to be achieved by pursuing this vegan diet. And then again, we have the study again showing that a vegan diet is probably the biggest way that we can reduce the impact. So it just helps holistically on so many different levels. And it's like, like this um, researcher said, it just decreases the emissions to such a large extent more than many other actions. So it's just a very big and significant way that we can help things with our actions. But, but studies aren't reliable, are they? But there's this concern that a lot of people raise that studies aren't reliable, that there's just different companies trying to push them in the direction that they want. But the thing is, if you look at these studies as well, you can research into them, you can research their methodology, you can research if they've had funding from corporations, and a lot of the time we find that those that are in support of animal products and animal agriculture have been supported by animal agriculture industries. But then when we look at these other studies, you might think there's an agenda to them, but when you look at the methodologies, they're not that problematic. They're actually very sound. And when you look at the funders, you see that it's just by more scientific organizations. It's not anything, there's no agenda, there's no matrix trying to control or, you know, like 
weaken people here. So these studies do have value. There's quite a lot of common objections and I'm not going to address all of them. But here's a few of them. So people will call out soy. They'll be like, soy, but you can't be having soy. You can't put on muscle without soy. You can't be having soy. Soy messes with your hormones. Well, <laughs> I'm not a soy boy for saying this, but in meta-analyses, so that's loads of studies that have been compared, we find that there's no effects on the hormones at all, really. Because the oestrogen that is present in, in soy is not really oestrogen, it's what's called phytoestrogen. It's a plant hormone. We're mammals, we're not plants, man. We're not affected by plant hormones. And at most it has some very weak effects both in oestrogenic ways and anti-oestrogenic ways. And it's just not something that is harmful in any way. Another thing is about plants feeling pain. So we don't really have any conclusive evidence on this because as far as we know it seems that pain is associated with having a central nervous system, oftentimes having a brain, oftentimes having pain receptors and these don't seem to be present in plants. But even if we are to grant that they're able to feel pain, we would end up killing a lot more plants in raising these animals because they have to be fed plants to be grown up. And then we kill those animals. So the amount of suffering, the amount of rights violations that would happen of conscious suffering beings, it'd be way more if we actually continue, continue pursuing animal agriculture. So either way, even if plants are able to feel pain, the way to reduce the amount of suffering that we cause is by pursuing that vegan diet. If you found yourself to be moved by this video, then I'm not going to be giving you the practical tips just yet of how to make this transition. There's a lot of content online that tells you of how you can change your lifestyle, but I can make one that's more specific if you want me to. I can make one more for someone who has self-improvement habits, someone who wants to put on muscle in the gym, for example. So if that's something that you want, then I can provide that as well. But for now, this video just is giving you some of the reasons, some of the arguments why it's better off to pursue veganism in terms of our moral lifestyle. Something else I wanted to keep in mind is that consider this as an idea, don't consider the actions of certain vegans, if they're cringe or whatever, if they're feminized or if they're, if they're soy boys. If you see some form of activism that seems extreme or radical, a lot of the time that's showing the extremity and how radical this industry is. It's showing how extreme these practices are. So if you found this video valuable, Make sure to subscribe because there's so much more value that's going to be coming to this channel. And if you look at some of the other videos, there should hopefully be quite a lot of value there as well. And remember bro, keep improving.